My message today is entitled, Waiting for a Miracle. Now the word miracle gets tossed around a lot. Um, probably one of the most famous ones in recent history. Remember um, that Olympic uh, hockey team where that sports annou announcer said when the United States team won, he says, do you believe in miracles? Do you believe in miracles? And he's all excited. Well, do you believe in miracles? What is a miracle? That word gets thrown around. Oh, I, he needs a miracle. Oh, I need a miracle. What does that mean? So that's what I want to talk about today. What is a miracle? Webster's Dictionary defines the word miracle as this. An extraordinary event manifesting divine intervention in human affairs. God has set up laws of nature, laws of physics, and things operate the way he set them to be. Right now, you may not even know it, you're not even thinking about it, but you're living under the law of gravity. If you weren't, your head would be bouncing off the ceiling. But there's laws all around us. And God operates within those laws because he's the one that established them. But sometimes, every once in a while, God will supersede those, or he'll alter the natural process of things. And that's called a miracle, because he's going beyond. Like, for example, when you cut your finger, no matter who you are, if you're a good person or a bad person, if you cut your finger, what's the first thing that happens? Blood comes out, right? And it comes out so that it keeps, as it's flowing out, it's keeping germs from going in. And then it starts to coagulate. And then it forms a scab. And then after a while, that scab falls off, and there might be a little bit of a mark. And then after long enough, you can't even tell it was there. That's a miracle. Now, it takes time for that. But if God did that instantaneous, and you saw it all, all those stages happening at once, you'd say, that's a miracle. Well, it's a miracle either way. It's just, if we see it all happen in a, in a sped up fashion, we say, it's a miracle. But there's miracles happening all around us all the time. You, I bet you haven't thought about it one time since you came in here. That your heart is pumping blood throughout your whole body. That's a miracle. I bet you never one time thought about, oh, I got to keep breathing. Oh, I got to keep breathing. That's a miracle. That out of, can you see any oxygen in this room? But somehow. Your lungs are getting oxygen out of this room. It's going in your lungs. The alveoli is now feeding that oxygen into all your blood cells. It's feeding oxygen into all the cells of your body. And then when you expel, you breathe out, carbon dioxide goes out. That's a miracle. The mere fact that you're even here. Did you know a hundred years ago none of us existed? But here we are. We're a miracle. So miracles happen around us all the time. But I want to share a story with you that is a good diagram of what we would call a miracle. Like, for example, we know the story of Moses, you know, on a clear blue day with not a cloud in the sky, it rained fire. That's a miracle. That doesn't usually happen. And of course, when he's standing up against the Red Sea and the Egyptian army's coming, all of a sudden the Red Sea parts open and they walk across on dry ground. That's a miracle. But there's a miracle that took place in the New Testament. Jesus did many miracles, but this one I want to talk about. It's found in Matthew 14, and I'm going to read verses 23 through 29. You've heard it before, a very familiar portion of Scripture. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come out unto, the, unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. 
And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Now there is a miracle. But let's look at this. First of all, Jesus said to them, he says, guys, get in the boat. I'll meet you on the other side. And he went up to pray. Now, did the disciples need a miracle? They're in this little boat in the middle of the, the Sea of Galilee, and it, it says the wind was contrary. That sounds so nice. Contrary. Oh, it's contrary. No. There were waves that were crashing, and this little boat was about to sink. And professional fishermen who made a living, I mean, these are all men in their late 20s, early 30s, who grew up on the Sea of Galilee, and they're thinking, we're going to die. And they rode all night long, and they didn't get any further than when they started out. So these guys needed a miracle, absolutely. But Jesus isn't with them. He's up on a mountain praying. There's a sample of um, Jesus is not with us right now, but he's up seated at the heavenly, uh, seated in heaven, on the right hand of God to ever make. Uh, intercession for us. Jesus is up on the mountain praying and did he physically look out and see this boat floundering in the water? Or did in the spirit, the Father says, you better go rescue these guys. But they need a miracle. And they're scared. The ship's about to sink. Now the last time they had something similar to this happen, Jesus was in the boat with them. And what Jesus did then, he's sleeping. He says, get in the boat, guys. We're going to the other side. And guess what? If Jesus says we're going to the other side, we're going to the other side. He is God. He's, everything he says is the word of God. If he says we're going to the other side, you're going to the other side. And he took a nap. He's tired. But these guys, again, scared to death. And they said, we got to do something. So they wake up Jesus and say, Lord, don't you care? We're about to perish. And Jesus wipes the sleep out of his eyes. He looks around and he says, oh, ye of little faith. And then he stands up at the bow of the ship and he says, peace, be still. And the Sea of Galilee turns into glass. And then he says, I'm going back to sleep. Don't wake me up anymore. And then they're like looking at each other like, wow, who is this guy? Even the elements listen to him. But this time, they're in the boat and Jesus ain't with them. Actually, He is. They just can't see Him. Just like Jesus is with you right now, you just can't see Him. So, I bet you, in the midst of all this, not one of the disciples said, Hey, why don't I go up to the bow of the ship and say, Peace, be still. It works for Jesus. I bet you none of them had that thought. They're all thinking, Where's Jesus when we need Him? We're going to die. We're going to sink. Well, what happens? Jesus comes to rescue them. And He's walking on water. Now, I always wondered about this. When He said, get in the boat, I'll meet you on the other side. He knew they were going in the boat alone. He was going to go up to the mountain and pray. Did He plan on walking across the Sea of Galilee? Maybe that was His plan. Maybe that was His intention. Or maybe... The disciples, I'm sure they weren't thinking he was going to do that. They're probably thinking, well, he'll catch the next boat. But we're <laughs> professional fishermen. We're going to row. We'll beat Jesus to the other side. He, they knew he wasn't going to get in an airplane and fly to the other side. He wasn't going to get in a Buick and drive around the Red Sea. They knew he was going to get there somehow. He said, well, I'll meet you over there. But here's Jesus. He comes to rescue them. They know he's not in the boat with them. And they look. And they say, oh no, fear gripped them. And they said, it's a spirit. Pretty interesting. Here's Jesus coming to rescue them. And they see him as an illusion. Do you remember the story in the book of Acts where Peter was in jail for preaching the gospel? And all the, all the other disciples and all the other believers are in the upper room. They're praying, oh Lord, please deliver Peter. Please get him out of jail. Please don't let any harm come to him. Well, while Peter was sleeping in the cell, an angel comes in and has to push him and wake him up. Say, hey, Pete, get up. You're, the door's open. Go home. And he wakes up. 
sure enough, the door's open, there's no guards there, so he walks to the upper room, and he's knocking on the door, and they won't let him in. They're inside praying, oh God, please let Peter free. And Peter's knocking on the door, but they won't let him in because they think, well, it's got to be a ghost. That can't be Peter. He's in jail. Do you think we need to change our vision a little bit here? These guys need a miracle. There's a miracle right in front of them, and they don't even think it's Jesus. They say, oh, it's an illusion. It's a ghost. And the fear gripped them. When you're in a situation when you need a miracle, God knows about it. Jesus is praying for you. But there's someone else that comes to play a part of this. He's that long-tongued tongue, liar. His name is Satan. And he'll come and whisper, God doesn't do miracles anymore. You better just take the easy route out. You better just go this way. Because God doesn't do miracles anymore. See, his modus operandi has never changed. What's the first recorded words in the Bible that we ever heard about Satan? He says to Eve, Hath God said? Always casting doubt on the Word of God. You have a dream. You have a vision. You have a desire in your heart. And the devil comes and That ain't going to happen. God's never going to set you free. God's never going to answer that prayer. God doesn't do miracles anymore. And the disciples... Here's Jesus walking on the water. And they say, oh no, they're afraid. It's a ghost. Well, Peter. Peter saw things different. He put his fear behind him. And he says, I think that is Jesus. And he says to him, hey, if you really are Jesus, then ask me to come out on the water. He challenged the miracle. Now, sometimes, I remember years and years I was in the faith movement and you never question anything you never challenge anything you know you operate by faith well you know when Jesus healed somebody you know what he did every time he says don't talk to anyone go show yourself to the priest because that's the Levitical law because if you were healed you'd have to go to the priest because that was like the or the current day doctor and you would go and he would look at you and say, yep, you're healed of leprosy. You can go back into the general population. In other words, the miracle that Jesus did for somebody, it stands up to scrutiny. It can be challenged. I remember one time I went to this church service and you know I used to wear glasses then. I was blind as a bat. Some things in life just never change. <clears throat> but this guy laid hands on me and he says, you're healed in the name of Jesus. And I took my glasses off and I threw them up on the altar. And he says, now I want you to come back tonight and testify you've been healed. And I said, okay, pastor, I will. And I had one problem. I was still blind as a bat. <laughs> Except now I threw my $100 glasses up on the altar and I was out 100 bucks. And all day long I struggled. Should I go back to that church service? And if I tell them I'm blind, see, I just lost my healing. Because out of your mouth, that confession, you're speaking it into, into existence. Or do I stand up there in faith and say, I'm healed, and I can see, but I'm really blind as a bat. But as soon as I say that, then God will heal me. And I, I had this struggle within me, and I'll just tell you, I wimped out. I didn't go back. I never went back to that church again. When God does a miracle, it can stand to be challenged. Because if God does something for you, it's concrete. It's more real than anything else. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things unseen. That word substance means concrete. When God does something in your life, it's real. That guy who Jesus laid hands on and he could see, he wasn't just walking around by faith saying, yeah, okay, Jesus said I can see. No, he could see. So Peter... He says, if you're really Jesus, you ask me to come out on that water. And Jesus said, come on out. The water's fine. And Peter, a human being just like you and I, but he trusted the word of Jesus. He believed God does miracles. And he put all his fear and he stuck it behind him. Do you think he was maybe a little bit scared walking out of a boat now this wasn't, the Sea of Galilee wasn't like glass. There's waves crashing over the boat. They're thinking they're going to die. 
And he gets out on that water, and it says, Peter walked on the water to go out to Jesus. A human being, just like you and I. Oh, he was St. Peter. He had a halo over his head, and he, he levitated. I got three words for that, and you know what they are. Baloney. He was a human being, just like you and I. But he trusted Jesus, and he walked on water. Now, there's a miracle for you. And where the other disciples, followers of Jesus, were hoping for a miracle, that Jesus would come save them, Peter, because he put his fear behind him, he not only saw the miracle, he experienced it. He was part of it. So, that's that one story. I could tell you all kinds of stories of miracles that Jesus did. And these guys saw those miracles. They saw blind eyes open. They saw deaf ears open. They saw men who were born crippled get up and walk away and carry their bed with them. They saw Jesus feed 5,000 people with a couple of loaves of bread and a couple of fish. But when they see him walking on water, they say, oh, I don't know. And they were fearful, and that fear grabbed them. And look at what Jesus said. He says, be of good cheer. Wait a minute. I'm in the middle of the, Red, or the, the Sea of Galilee, and I'm about to sink, and you're telling me to cheer up? He says, it's I. Don't be afraid. When we're in the middle of a, a, a catastrophe or a disaster, and we need a miracle, by the way, I don't want to scare you, but God only does miracles when miracles are needed. Amen. You know, there's this thought, and I know I was part of it for a while, that thinks God is nothing but a circus performer. And when you come to church, if you all join together and you have enough faith, God will do some circus tricks for you. Oh, He'll do all kinds of things, and you can jump and dance and holler and scream and may rain gold dust, and you know someone's arm may grow, and all these wonderful things. God's a circus performer. Let's go to church and see what Jesus is going to do. But God ain't nobody's circus performer. Amen. He doesn't jump through anybody's hoops. He only does miracles when miracles are needed. Yes. Now, here, who, who here wants to be in a situation where you need a miracle? Not me. I don't want no miracle. I don't want to be in that situation. Remember when the people came to Jesus and they said, Hey, Lord, it's so much fun to be around you. You do all kinds of great things. Show us a sign. Come on, entertain us. And Jesus said, Well, what would you like me to do? No. No. He said, a wicked and a perverse generation seeketh a sign. And no sign is going to be given them except the sign of Jonas. God doesn't jump through anybody's hoops. He does miracles only when miracles are needed. Amen. So here's a $64,000 question. Does God still do miracles today? Yes. Well, I want to share a couple of scriptures with you. Because it doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter what you say. It only matters what God says. 1 Corinthians 12.10 To another, the working of miracles. Now he goes on, because this is a list of the gifts of the Spirit. Okay? And one of them is the working of miracles. So why would God tell the Apostle Paul to put in this list of the gifts of the Holy Spirit when somebody has the Holy Spirit working in their life. One of them, the working of miracles if He doesn't do miracles today. So, it only stands to reason if He gives the body of Christ the gift of the Spirit of the working of miracles, that means He does miracles today, wouldn't you say? Amen. He goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 12, 28 and 29, And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondary prophets, Thirdly, teachers. After that, miracles. Then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversity of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? See, in 1210, he's talking about the gifts of the Spirit. In 1228 and 29, he's talking about the office that the Holy Spirit sets up in the church. And one of the offices, the, one of the gifts of the Spirit is the working of miracles. One of the offices in the body of Christ is a worker of miracles. Yeah, but 
I don't know. I mean, are we supposed to do that today? And are miracles really for today? Well, then listen to Jesus. If you don't want to listen to the Apostle Paul, in John 14, 12, Jesus said this, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Did Jesus do any great works? Did He do any miracles? Well, He's saying to me and you, you can do the same things I did, only greater. Now, what's greater than raising somebody from the dead? I don't think it means greater in magnificence. I think it means greater in volume. Because the body of Christ, Jesus was only one place on earth when He was here in the flesh. The body of Christ is everywhere in the world today. So just in volume, he says, but we can do miracles. Or, I can't really do a miracle, but I can be used as a conduit in which God can work a miracle through. So does God do miracles today? Yes. I believe so. So how do we receive a miracle? You may be in a situation where you say, you know what, I'm in a tough situation. I don't know what to do. Do I go this way or that way? I want to go this way, but what do I do? I need a miracle. How do we receive that miracle? In Mark 16, 17, this is what Jesus said. But these signs shall follow them that believe. And he goes on in verse 17 and 18, and he talks about this list of things that the body of Christ will do. But it, the precursor to that is, these are the signs that follow them that believe. You have to believe that God does miracles. If you don't, He won't bother you. If you don't believe in casting out devils or speaking with new tongues, don't worry, He won't bother you. He won't make you do those things. He won't lead you in that situation. Oh, I don't believe in that. Okay, then fine, He won't bother you. You know, God is, the Holy Spirit's a mighty rushing wind, but He's also as gentle as a dove. He won't force Himself on you. But if you say, you know what? I do believe in that. I do believe God could use me as a conduit to do miracles. Well, now the door is open. He said, that's what I'm looking for. In James chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, it says this, But let him ask in faith nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So what God is telling us, if you ask in faith, you can't waver. Well, God, I really want you to help me out of this situation. I believe you're going to, and I believe you have the answer, but I don't know, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. All those people are better than I am. There's no way out of this. Well, you're wavering. It's like, it's Christmas time, and you're saying, God, I wish I had a new car. And I come over to your house, here's the keys to a brand new shiny red Corvette. And you're going, wow, I've been praying for a car. Thank you. But as you reach out to take it, you say, but I don't know. Are you really, is this a joke? You wouldn't really do that. Why would you give me a brand new Corvette? Well, I'm telling you, it's yours. Well, I don't know, but I, you know what I did last week? I'm not really that good. And I'm saying, I don't care. I want to give you this. Yeah, but... I know, and I gave, I gave your neighbor next door one, and he took it, and he's driving up and down the street. Yeah, I know, but he's better than I am. And, and you're wavering. Jesus said, be of good cheer, my little children. It's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. God's not stingy. He wants to bless us. He wants to help us. He wants to do miracles in our lives. He wants us to get, to get us out of tough situations. But if we say, well, I don't know, you're wavering. You're double-minded. Well, I believe God can do anything on Sunday morning, but Wednesday afternoon and you're at work and your boss says you're no good and he doesn't like the way you do this, do this and do that and do everything else or you're out of here and you're like, I don't know, is God going to help me? And, and you're wavering. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And it says... You can't receive anything of the Lord. Because you can't receive anything from God without faith. Because, can you, right, look around. Does anybody here see God? 
No, because God is eternal, so He's unseen. God lives in the spirit realm. God is a spirit. So how do I? I'm, can you see me? I'm here. I'm in the flesh. I'm natural like you. I need something here on earth. I need something tangible. I need a bottle of water. Okay? I need this. I can feel it. I can taste it. I can smell it. I can hear it. It's real. So how is this invisible spiritual God going to get me a bottle of water? Dumb example, I know. The only way is through faith. That road that travels from heaven that I can't see to this physical world where I live, that road is the way of faith. And if I believe God's going to meet my needs and He's going to get me a bottle of water, He's going to get me a bottle of water. Because that faith turns what's spiritual into physical. It says that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns every diamond and every diamond mine in the world. Do you think God has a lack of finances? A lack of resources? We have to believe and we have to ask in faith and don't waver. And the reason that we waver is, well, I've asked for miracles before and I didn't get them. Well, our emotions will steal that. The red Corvette's on its way, but you say, ah, I don't think God's really going to do it. The red Corvette turns around and has to go back to heaven. In Galatians 6 9, it says, And let us not be weary in well doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. It takes patience. My least favorite thing in all of life patience. But God's doing something in us as He's using us as a conduit to do a miracle. In Luke 11 10, it says, For everyone that seeketh receiveth. And he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. So just a few people that ask receive? No, everyone that asks. But that word asketh in the Greek means in the continuation. You keep asking. You don't give up. God, I have a need here. And you keep asking. You're going to receive. But when God does a miracle, I promise you two things. It won't be the way you expected, and it won't be the time that you thought. Because God doesn't fit inside anybody's box. I'll bet you a dollar and a nickel that when Moses led that, was following that pillar of cloud, and he led, here's these millions of Jews alongside the Red Sea, and then he looks, and here on the other side of the pillar of a cloud is the Egyptian army, I'll bet you a dollar and a nickel Moses wasn't saying, ah, ha, ha, they fell into my trap. No, he's probably like, God, did you make a mistake? I followed your pillar, and look at where you got me. I don't think he woke up that morning and said, man, I can't wait to wake up today. I get to hold my staff out over the Red Sea and watch it part. He didn't have a clue what God was doing. And God only does a miracle when miracles are needed, and He only comes through at the perfect timing for your benefit and His glory. So, also, he that seeketh will find. But you've got to be looking for it. And you've got to put on your spiritual spectacles. You've got to see as God sees. Because like I said, there's miracles going on all around us all the time. Jake told us how he got hit by that car. And you say, wow, where was God in that? Our brother Jake worked hard all day. He wants to go home and put his feet up and watch Hallmark movies with Renee. <laughs> God probably spared you from that. <laughs> and he gets hit by a car. Where's the miracle in that? Because he's sitting right there telling us about it and nothing happened to him. That's the miracle. God does things for different reasons and different ways that we can't even comprehend. I remember one time many years ago, I went to a court of car wash. And I pulled in and I looked and man, I didn't have enough quarters. So I walked over to the, you know, the changer where you put in the dollars and they spit out quarters. And I'm, you know, doing that and I get all these quarters and I'm as I'm walking back to my car, I'm counting my quarters and I had my head down while I dropped a quarter. 
and I'm mad because I'm in a hurry. I had to get back home and do things. So I have to reach down and pick up this quarter. And as I did, the cars are coming in this way. Some guy went the opposite way and he's speeding through this empty um, little stall. And if I would have kept walking, he would have ran into me and threw me 10 feet in the air. But because I dropped a quarter and reached down to pick it up, God did a miracle. He spared me. Well, that doesn't seem like a miracle, but I'm still here standing to tell you about it. And I don't have braces on my legs and I'm not sitting in a wheelchair. He that seeketh, you'll find. And to him that knocketh, it shall be open at the right time, in the right way. In a way that's going to be, when you look back, you're going to say, wow, I'm glad God did it that way. And you're going to get the most benefit out of it, and He's going to get the most glory out of it. I've told you before, when Bob and I were looking for a house, we looked at a lot of houses. And when we got to the house we're living in now, I said to Bob, I said, man, I can't wait to get out of here. This place is a dump. And as we get in the car driving away, I said, man, wasn't that place terrible? And Bob says, yeah, but wasn't the kitchen nice? And now 26 years later, after I totally redid the whole house inside and out, yeah, we live in a nice house. But that's not the way I would have done it. But looking back now, I'm so glad I didn't buy any of those other houses I was thinking about buying. I like where I live. I like my little house. It's perfect for me and Bobette. God's doing something. Now in Isaiah 55 and verse 8, it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. God does things different than how we can even comprehend, mm -hmm. different than we can even think. Perfect example. There's this man named David. He ends up being the king of Israel. And he spent a good portion of his life running and hiding from the current king who wanted to kill him. And when he takes over and he becomes king, he brings the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem and he sets up the, the tabernacle in the wilderness and here's the Ark of the Covenant. And David builds himself a house. A really nice house. And he's sitting in his house one day and he's thinking, you know what? It's just not right that I have such a nice house. And God, whose presence is in the Ark of the Covenant, is living in a tent. He says, I want to build a house for God. Now, doesn't that seem like a, a noble thing, a good thing, a godly thing? So he starts gathering all this um, materials and equipment. And he says, God, dear Lord, please let me build you a house. The most beautiful house this world has ever seen. And God says, no. You go, wait, I want to do this good thing for you. And God says, no, I don't want you to. You're not going to be the one to build me a house. I want you to go home and I want you to build your son. I want you to build up Solomon. Pour your wisdom. Pour your experience. All the Psalms that you wrote. I want you to pour those into him because your son is going to be the one that's going to build me a house. And the temple of Solomon, even to this day, people can't even fathom how beautiful it must have been. Everything was either solid gold or it was covered in gold. And God says, no, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. I do things differently. I know things you don't know. And David wanted to build him a house. God says, no, I want you to build me a son. And that son will build me a house. So, here's my question. Do you need a miracle today? Maybe a physical one. For the past three weeks, me and Bob have been barking like seals and home and sick and just bored out of our minds. And I needed the physical healing. And here I am. I'm standing here. Do you need an emotional healing? Maybe a spiritual healing. Maybe you just feel like you're a million miles away from God. Remember the old saying, whenever it feels like you're down to nothing, God's up to something. He's never going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you. He wouldn't die on a cross to save you and then say, well, good luck, hope you make it on your own. Even in the darkest time, He's with you. He hasn't given up. Maybe you need a financial miracle. Maybe you need a relationship miracle. You need a relationship with 
family or friends or somebody you once knew years ago, you need that reconciliation. Maybe you need some kind of miracle. So, is it possible? Don't listen to me. Just listen to what Jesus said. Mark 9, 23. Jesus said this, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. If you can believe, some things are possible. Most things are possible. A few things are possible. All things are possible. Now you may say, okay, when I get out of this church service, when I go out in the parking lot, there's going to be that beautiful brand new red Corvette with my name on the license plate and a set of keys. I'm believing that. Well, God's ways are not your ways. When I go out in that parking lot, I'm going to have a vehicle, and it's going to get me from point A to point B exactly the way God wants me to arrive. I'm not supposed to tell him how to do the miracle. And I'm not supposed to tell him when to do the miracle. I'm supposed to believe he's going to do the miracle. He's going to take care of me. And if you believe, all things are possible. Because, you know, like the old saying about, you know, the dog's standing in front of you and he's nothing but skin and bones and he's just chewing on that bone and he's growling at you. Don't take my bone out of my mouth. And you're over there with a thick, fat T-bone steak with, you know, medium grilled and it's got A1 sauce on it and smothered in oven or onions and mushrooms and you're saying, here doggy, here, here Fido, come on. He says, no, don't you take that bone out of my mouth. No, just drop the bone and you can have this beautiful T-bone steak. I'll even throw in a baked potato. <laughs> That's what we're like. God says, don't you know what I want to do in your life? And what I want to do in your life is going to have eternal consequences. I'm not just going to give you something to satisfy your wills and your whims right now. And then 10 years from now, you're going to go, so what? I want to do something in your life that has eternal consequences. And if you believe that he does have your best in mind, and you're saying, I'm open to all possibilities, whatever you want to do, all I know is I need help right here and now. I'll bet you anything, when those disciples were in that boat and they're thinking, we're going to die, we're going to drown, I'll bet you none of them said, I'll bet you Jesus is going to come walking down the water to come get us. I'll bet you not one of them thought that. Now, I'm going to close with this thought. I'm going to change gears on you a little bit. <coughs> Talk about God does a miracle when a miracle is needed. <clears throat> we as a country need a miracle. And not just we as a country, but we as a planet, we need a miracle. I don't want to scare you, but did you hear there's a pandemic going around? Did you hear that our lives have been altered and changed? Did you hear that an election took place that's very questionable with the outcome? And one person says, it's going to be a dark winter. It's going to be hard. And I already see the people in the four shadows saying, oh, we're going to take control and we're going to finally make this country the country we wanted it to be. And you look at the future of that and it doesn't seem very optimistic or positive to me. <coughs> I've got a question for you. If a tree falls in the woods and there's no one there to hear it, does that tree make a sound? How do you know? You've never been there when a tree fell down and you weren't there. How do you know? Here's another question for you. When you close the door on your refrigerator, does the light bulb really go out? How do you know? Have you ever crawled in your refrigerator and had someone close the door? How do you know? I can give you the answer to both of those. Because of God's laws, the laws of physics, the laws of nature, don't change. When a tree falls in the woods and there's nobody to hear it, God's there. And that tree, the laws of physics, when that solid mass falls, it breaks the sound of the air around it and it hits other trees and it, it makes noise and it shakes the earth when it hits the ground and the little birdies fly away and the little chipmunks and bunnies run away. It makes sound. You may not be there to hear it. 
just because you can't be there to hear it doesn't mean it's not important. Well, what about when I close my refrigerator door? How do I know the light bulb goes out? Because I work for the Sub-Zero refrigerator <laughs> company, and I've been to the factory. And believe me, when they take a refrigerator, they tear it to smithereens. And I've seen what it's like when you close that door. I guarantee you that magnetic seal, and it breaks the connection, and the electricity going to that light bulb is shut off. That light goes out. You can even set a Sabbath mode on it so that when you open the refrigerator on the Sabbath mode, the light bulb doesn't come on. And you can even type in with Wi-Fi, and you can be sitting in your office 50 miles away and look and see, oh, somebody just opened the refrigerator, there's a light bulb going on. So I got the answer for that. Just like people say, well, what came first, the chicken or the egg? And so nobody knows the answer. Well, I do. It's very simple. I've read the Bible. How did God make Adam and Eve as two embryos and they grew up to be male and female? No, he took mud and he formed Adam and made him a whole man. Then he put him to sleep and says, hey, Adam, you're going night-night, but you ain't going to believe what's going to happen when you wake up. And he pulls out a rib and he makes this, whoa, man. And they're whole. And because of those two coming together, then after their own kind, that's where all the people came from. God made an entire bear as a full-grown male bear and a female bear. And they came together and after their own kind. When a male bear and a female bear mate, you've never once seen them have an alligator. <laughs> when an alligator, a male and female come together, you never once saw a rhinoceros come out of that. After their own kind. So when a rooster and a chicken came together, that's where the first egg came from. It's all God's laws. Now, you may be saying, all right, Pastor Dave, I think you've gotten too far down the beaten path here. What's this got to do with anything? It leads me to my final question to you. If you don't see something show up on the television screen, did it really happen? You know, we live in a world of screens. We have television screens, we have small ones, we have big ones. We go to the movies, or at least we used to, we have movie screens. We have computer screens. We have screens on our televisions. We have screens on our wristwatches. And if we see it on there, then, oh, it happened. I saw it. Here, let me send you the YouTube picture. We're living in screens. But what if something doesn't show up on the screen? Did it really happen? Don't listen to what the television says about a pandemic. Any of those screens. Don't listen to what a screen says, any of those screens, about how we're supposed to live our lives. Because the rules change every five minutes. And don't listen to what is said on any screen about how the election of this presidency is going to end. Does this country need a miracle? We need a lot of miracles. But I heard a statement from General Flynn the other day. He said, if this country loses its freedom, the world loses its freedom because we are the last standard. Now I know, because I've read it in the book of Revelation, there's going to be a one world government someday. And there's going to be a one world leader. His name is the anti or substitute Christ. And he's going to rule the world with an iron thumb or an iron fist. Remember when Jesus walked into the room and that demon jumped or shouted out of the man? He says, Oh, Son of God, why have you come to torment us before the time? Everything has a time. I'll tell you when this one world government's going to take over. I'll tell you when this one world leader's going to take over when the church is gone. Because we are the salt of the earth. We are the preservant. When the church is gone, all hell is going to break loose. But guess what? Where are you at? Where am I at? We're still here on the earth. So it ain't going to happen yet. And those that are saying, oh, there's no hope. This new leadership's going to come in and they've got all their agenda and they're going to turn this into a socialistic society and there's no hope. Just give up. We're all going to shrivel up and die. And I got three words for that. Baloney. Because it ain't over till God says it over. Yeah, but I didn't see it on, on a TV screen. Well, I don't care. 
There's all kinds of things that are going on behind the scenes that you ain't never going to see on a TV screen. Uh -huh. So miracles take place when God says miracles are going to take place, the way He says they're going to take place, and when they're going to take place. So you know what? You personally, do you need a miracle in your life? Do you need direction? Do you need courage? Do you need a friend? Do you need somebody to confide in? Do you need, you need better finances? Do you need to heal an old relationship? What do you need? God's here to mend and to help and to do that miracle. And you might be the, the conduit that's going to bring healing to somebody else. And this country that needs healing, there's something we got to make sure we never forget. Never forget God's faithfulness. Amen. And God is faithful. Yes. And God honors His promises. And I told you this the last time we were here three weeks ago. When, God, when Jesus and the two angels came to Abraham and they argued, they debated back and forth, they said, and Abraham says, if there's just ten righteous, will you please spare Sodom and Gomorrah? He says, yep, yeah, okay, but there wasn't ten righteous. Well, there are ten righteous at least in this country. I'm righteous, you're righteous. Why? Because I'm so good? No, because we're the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We're covered in His blood. And do you remember months ago when we had that screen up here on the screen and we had a whole day of prayer and fasting when there was that the return and there was millions of people that went to the march in Washington, D.C. and cried out to God, save our country. And they blew shofars and they sang praise songs to Jesus. And the President of the United States wrote a letter that said, myself and the First Lady are with you and we join with you in prayer. Do you think God's going to forget that? God says, I will never leave you or forsake you. David said, I was once old or once young. I'm now old. I've never once seen the righteous forsaken. Mm. It ain't over till God says it's Amen. over. So don't you lose hope about anything that's going on in your personal life. And don't you lose hope about what's going on in this country because God is percolating stuff in the background. Amen. You just wait. Amen. You just wait. So, as usual, I always pray, Lord, how do you want me to end this service? And in spite of a, a problem, I'm going to do what God told me to do. Jesus said, if any two or three of you shall agree as touching anything on earth, it shall be done by my Father which is in heaven. So what I want to do is I want to pray with you. But you're human and I'm human. And you're going to say, do I want to go up there and pray with Pastor Dave? He had COVID-19. I don't want to get that. Well, in the natural realm, that was three weeks ago. But I am going to understand you being, you being a little leery and shy. That's fine. Now, Jesus said, if any two or three of you shall agree as touching anything, it doesn't mean I have to touch you. I have to shake your hand or put my hand on your shoulders. We don't have to touch. Think of it this way. If any two or three of you shall agree concerning anything that you ask, it shall be done by my Father which is in heaven. Now, if you don't want to do that, hallelujah, you don't have to. You just sit in your chair and pray. But if you would like to, I'm going to stand up here, and I want you to just come and just whisper whatever that miracle is you're looking for. It may be something you gave up years ago, a dream, and you say, ah, that's never going to happen. God doesn't do miracles anymore. Don't listen to that long-tongued liar. God is God. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Whatever that miracle is you need, or something to happen in the future, I want you to come up and just whisper in my good ear. <laughs> And I'll agree with you. I'm not going to touch you. I'm just going to agree with you. And, and we'll move on. So whosoever will, come on up.